Hi there, in today's video I want to talk to you about regjet takeoff, okay? We are going to analyze what is this maneuver and why it is so important to know when to perform a regjet takeoff, okay? So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Hi there, I'm Gabriele from pilotclimb.com. I help you to become a better pilot. So if you are interested, consider subscribing to the channel. And if you want to support my work, please give it a like to the video. This is very important for me. All right, so let's talk about the regjet takeoff. First of all, what is a regjet takeoff? A regjet takeoff is a maneuver that normally the captains take the decision to perform, okay, when there is something wrong with the aircraft throughout the takeoff roll, okay? So, Anytime you feel that, anytime the captain feels that it's more appropriate to reject the takeoff rather than continue the takeoff, he has to perform this reject the takeoff maneuver. Okay? So the reject takeoff maneuver, as you may know already, is not a maneuver that we perform every day. Okay? So no, normally you won't perform any reject takeoff in real life for years, even though you're flying every day, because that's not really a very common maneuver. Normally, the first thing that you do during the reject takeoff maneuver, it might change between companies and between aircraft and so on, but the first thing that you want is to cut the power of your aircraft. So normally you close the thrust lever, and then the second thing, and then the third and so on, you actually give the priority to stop the plane, okay? But what are the implications with the reject takeoff maneuver? First of all, we need to know that the, the takeoff is divided into two sections, okay? And then again, guys, it might change between the operators, but normally the takeoff is divided between a low speed range and high speed range. So if you are within the low speed range, okay, they typically is with between 80 to 100 knots, okay, let's call it 80 knots for this example, okay. On the low speed range, you want to reject the takeoff for any reasons, basically. So if you're doing, you're just starting the rotation, okay, so you're just starting the takeoff run, and then something happens to your aircraft, okay, a master caution, a light, whatever, you basically want to reject takeoff by then. Okay, why do you do that? Because since it's a low speed reject takeoff maneuver, that is uh, not a big deal, okay? It's an easy maneuver, you can stop the plane, you can go back and check what happened and the stand with the maintenance guys, for example. Okay, you call main troll, you call maintenance and then check the plane and then you take off again once you are released by main troll, okay? But the thing becomes a lot more uh, interesting when you go into this high speed zone. The high speed zone, let's call it from 80 knots all the way down to the V1, is when things became complicated because in the high speed range, in high speed area, okay, you really want to reject off only for specific reasons, okay, because the higher the speed during the takeoff run, okay, let's say 120 knots on your takeoff run, you're there, you're there, you're taking off, you read 120 knots, and then something happens, you don't want to reject takeoff for any reasons, okay, so the higher the speed, the better it is to continue. Okay, so that's why on the high speed range we only reject takeoff for specific uh, reasons, okay? That might be an engine failure, maybe a wind shear warning, maybe an, a fire, but we don't reject takeoff for any lights or we don't reject takeoff for any, any, let's say, minor failures, okay? So as you can see already, throughout the takeoff, the pilots have to quick judge if that, uh, that failure, that problem that come out, come out during the takeoff run is a problem that's actually is big enough to reject takeoff or not. So as you can see, there is a lot of decision making and that's why it is so important to be very familiar with the type of failure that will uh, make you to reject the takeoff and be familiar with the maneuver of the reject takeoff, okay? Why we've got this uh, high speed and low speed range, okay? It's it's the problem with the high speed range that if you reject takeoff at high speed, okay, first of all, many uh, reject takeoff end up with a runway veer off. Okay, so some guys, some pilots, I'm not judging because you cannot judge a pilot if you're not there. Okay, you cannot judge the a pilot that you're making, or you cannot judge any uh, in general if you're not there in that situation. Okay, you can study what happened, you can learn from the mistakes of others, but never judge because you don't know how would you react if you were in their position. Okay. So, but by studying what happened in the past, we saw that at high speed, the reject takeoff maneuver becomes a lot more complicated. Thus, many planes, while performing the reject takeoff at high speed, they end up doing a veer off, for example, or they end up not really respecting the V1 decision call where I made a separate video about V1, but at, by the V1, 
you should take the decision whether to continue or stop the plane. And sometimes happens that after V1, someone decides to stop the plane, to reject takeoff, and you cannot do that. So what happens is that, let's say you pass V1, you have a problem, and you stop at the takeoff. The runway won't be enough for you to stop the plane in most cases, okay? So what will happen, they end up out of the runway as well in that case, okay? But the main thing, let's say you do everything by heart, okay? You are very high speed, you are approaching V1, and you decide to stop the takeoff because you have an engine failure, which is a perfectly maneuver, okay? So you stop the takeoff. What you have to think about, it, the most important thing is your brake pressure, okay? And your brake temperature, because once you stop the plane at very high speed, if you have performed the jet takeoff at very high speed, the biggest threat there is the temperature of your brakes, okay? So, because if you think about that too, when you are taking off, your aircraft is very heavy because you've got all the passengers, all the bags, but on top of that, you have got all the fuel on board. If you have done, if you're performing a long flight, you have a lot of fuel. So the weight of the aircraft is very high. If you're a jet takeoff at high speed, the brakes will have a lot of stress because they're stopping an aircraft with a lot of weight, a very heavy aircraft, okay? So that's why it is very important at high speed you really take into consideration your brake. Happened in the past that some pilots they did the reject takeoff, they stopped the plane at high speed and then they had fire coming out of the brakes because of the temperature of the brake was too high. The temperature of the brake is not something that you need to take into consideration only before the takeoff, but you need to take this into consideration for all your flights. Let me explain what I mean. So let's say you're flying from Rome to Madrid and then from Madrid to Rome. So you're doing a two sector day, okay? So you take off from Rome, okay, you arrive in Madrid, you land, what will happen? You land, you apply brakes, fantastic. The temperature of your brakes will go up because you just landed. Then you do a long taxi in Madrid and you're gonna be braking constantly in order due to, the, due to the tax, okay, because you may have traffic, you may have to do the turns and so on. So the temperature of the brakes is still high. You, you get to the parking stand, okay, and once you get to the parking stand, you really need to respect the brake cooling schedule. What is the brake cooling schedule? It's a table or anyway, a software that will tell you how many minutes has to pass before the actual brake temperature goes down enough before performing another takeoff, okay? And if you don't respect this, you will be in uh, troubles, okay? Because let's say you land in Madrid, you go to the stand, you don't respect the brake cooling schedule, so you don't allow the brakes to go down, okay? So let's say you are on the stand, you offload passengers, you get passengers on board, you go and you perform another takeoff, okay? If you didn't respect this brake temper, brake, brake cooling schedule, okay? What will happen if you perform another uh, reject takeoff? Let's say you are in Madrid, you start a takeoff and you have to reject at high speed. That's where the problem is, because if, you, if, they, if your brakes were warm or hot already, if the temperature of your brake were, was high already before the takeoff, because you didn't respect the brake cooling schedule on the, on the parking stand in Madrid, that's where the problem comes. Okay, then the temperature of the brake can go very high, you, can, you may have smokes and fire and so on. So that's why it is so important that you actually take into consideration your brake temperature during the landing for your next takeoff, okay? That's the way you, you must think about, okay? Because don't just think that it's fine, okay? Because, and that's why we have this brake cooling schedule, because on the brake cooling schedule, once you park the aircraft, you read you, in, the, in this table, you say, okay, we need 45 minutes before we can take off. So no matter if you have the passenger on board, the fuel, everything, everything is great, you need to wait these 45 minutes. The problem is not because the temperature of the brakes is too high at that moment is because if you need to perform another takeoff and you, the temperature of the brake is already high, you might end up in troubles if you perform the jet takeoff. All right, so I hope you now uh, have a better idea of what the brake cooling schedule is and what is the jet takeoff. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and I will help you out. Also go to paddockclimb.com where you can subscribe for free paddock training content. I wish you a great day and I'll see you on the next one.